Hello and welcome to Linden Hall in Deal, Kent. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Norma Winston, one of our finest jazz singers, jazz musicians, and somebody who's been absolutely at the top of jazz music and improvised music for a very long time, although it sounds awful to say very long time. <laughs> but I'm so pleased to see you here. Well, it has been a very long time, yeah. When you were studying, uh, when you were at school, when you were studying, you were, uh, I think piano and organ were your, the instruments you were learning at that time. Yeah, well, the, I, I, yes, I was learning piano. I had a very brief spell of learning piano when I was about eight, and I, we were living in Bow, and I had a piano teacher that came to the house, and she, that she then, after about eighteen months, she got pregnant, and. <laughs> wasn't coming to anybody's house to teach anymore. So if you wanted a lesson, you'd have to go to her. And we had no way of getting there. We didn't have a car or anything like that. And so I stopped having lessons. And then when I was 10, we were moved to Dagenham. We got this council house in Dagenham. And we'd been on the waiting list for eight years, you know, and uh, finally got this house. And um, the, the, my new school, my class teacher played the piano and the local authorities sent round forms saying, well, if you want to apply for a junior exhibition, you know, fill this in. So I didn't take the form. And she said, what, why didn't you take a form? You play the piano, you, you, you should take it. And I said, no, I don't have a teacher. I'm not learning anymore. And she said, well, find some of the music that you played when you were learning and I'll coach you after school. And she did. And, you know, I had to get, do two exams and I suddenly found myself going to Trinity College on Saturday for, uh, you know, lessons, piano lessons and musicianship classes, which was a big shock to me and everybody. And, um, and at the same time, I took the 11 plus and scraped, you know, an interview because my arithmetic was terrible, but the English was good. And um, I found myself going to a grammar school as well. <laughs> so it was a, yeah, it was a big time. But I, I really hadn't had that many lessons on piano. Um, but there you are, somehow I got in. It was meant to be. Obviously. <laughs> So in your, new, in, your, in your new school, the ground school in Dagenham, uh, there was somebody actually at that school too, I think uh, a few years above, who yes. also went on to do, uh, do great things. Yeah, Dudley Moore. He was in, his, in the sixth form and uh, I was just in the first year. And of course, I was immediately smitten by him. <laughs> so good looking. And, <laughs> and he played the piano. And he used to play for the, um, the, the you know, assembly classes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he also played for the choir, which you couldn't get into until the second year, by which time, you know, I, I wanted to join and he'd gone by then. He, he got a scholarship to um, Magdalen College, Oxford, um, on organ. And I was supposed to take a second study, you know, at Trinity. And and someone said to me once, why didn't you take singing as a second study? And I said, well, because the only kind of singing that they would teach you there was classical singing. There was no way that you could learn anything about popular music or jazz. And I had heard Sinatra and Ella Fitzgerald, and that's what I wanted to do. So it didn't occur to me to, to take singing. So I took organ because of having been influenced by Dudley. <laughs> Where did you play the organ? Was there one Where? at school? Um, no, there wasn't one at school. Um, I used to go to the local church to practice and... Um, A full pipe organ? Yeah. yeah. It was terrifying in the winter, you know, because you go in and it's pitch dark <laughs> and I'd run and switch all the lights on and then switch the organ on and you'd hear this... And if anybody happened to walk in, it was really frightening. But um, yeah, I sort of, well, I gave it all up after a few years. But um, I don't 
don't know, I was, I, I was afraid of playing in front of people. And you used to have to do that at Trinity. At the end of every term, you'd have to do a concert and play it, at least a, not a whole concert, but part of a concert. And for some reason, I, I just was afraid to play in front of people. But you didn't have any fear singing. Well, I did, but I wanted to do that so much more that I overcame it. And people often ask me, well, how do you cope with nerves? What, what tips have you got? And um, I, I said, well, you just have to keep doing it. You know, when I, I used to sing in the, at the beginning, I, I got a few gigs um, singing standards. And I would come up in a, in a heat, like, look like a heat rash on my neck and my arms and I would shake. But I kept doing it because I really wanted to do it. And eventually, if you do a thing enough, you, you, know, you, you somehow get over it. Tell me, tell me about those early gigs of sitting in with people, turning up at parts and venues and just hanging out, waiting to get called up. How did that work out? Um, well, it obviously worked out okay because I did manage to, to get some jobs, you know. I, but I was very shy and still very nervous. And I, but I really so wanted to do it. And uh, I had my repertoire and because I'd had these... Well, some people say, well, how do you... Did you have singing lessons? And of course I had some singing lessons, but they were from somebody who was a saxophone player, I think, and played the piano. And he, he taught me about breathing, as you, you know, using the diaphragm, which of course I didn't know anything about. And each week we would work on a song. And he'd find out which key I did it in, and he gave me exercises to, to practice, which I did, because they were the only thing that I had, so mm. I practiced a lot. And, um, and then he started to get me some work with people who had bands that he knew. But it was deadly, for, as far as I was concerned. It was weddings and functions. And I'd heard jazz by this time, and so I was in, slightly improvising and you know, altering the tune. And the, the people would say, well, where did you get that from? Which record did that come from? And I said, well, no, I just made it up. And um, it probably wasn't very good. Well, they, they didn't seem to like it. And I thought, well, if I've got to do this, I don't want to do it at all. So I stopped doing those sort of gigs and I set about making sure that I had a repertoire that I could, would really love to sing if I ever met the right people. And I, I knew somebody, I met somebody in this job I was doing, I was working during the day, and she heard that I liked jazz, and she said, oh, there's a trio that plays in this pub near where I live, in East Ham. Um, why don't you come down there? So I did, and I asked if I could sing a couple of songs, and they reluctantly agreed. <laughs> and at the end of the evening, they had a singer who, who was leaving. And they said, would you like to sing with us two nights a week? So that's how it started, really. And then I met various people that came in to the pub, other musicians. And um, well, who knows how it works? I don't know, but it's like a snowball, really. And I'd go around and I'd ask if I could sing at uh, different places. And, um, and generally, I would get some work that way. And that's, that's the way you did it then. Because there weren't any colleges, you couldn't learn anything. You weren't, there wasn't any jazz education, except what you learnt yourself from listening. Um, but it was an incredible era, because there were so many contemporaries of yours who were so gifted and so talented. Mm. I mean, if we just look at a, Michael Garricky and Carl Kenny Wheeler, Tony Co, Bobby Will and Stan Tracy. I mean, it's an incredible list of musicians. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's the most memorable era. Uh, to be among that group of musicians, uh, all coming through together and all creating 
new ideas. It, it was the 60s and so many things mm. were changing. And jazz was changing tremendously, influenced by all the different things that were going on. There was so, so much free thinking and new ideas. It's true. And in with that, there's the old place, Ronnie Scott's old place, oh, yes. uh, yeah, John Stevens. <laughs> and that, that must have been a terribly important part of your development. Well, it was. I mean, John Stevens, I met um, when I went, a friend of mine was playing at the Charlie Chester Club. And I went there to see this friend who was playing. And he said, oh, get up and sing something. And I did. And John Stevens was on drums. This is before free music. And I sat in and he said, I'm, at the end of the evening, he said, I'm going to tell Ronnie Scott about you. And I thought, well, I can't believe that in a minute it happens. <laughs> but it, it, it did happen. And uh, he said, I'm going to organize a, a trio and we'll rehearse and, you know, and, and, and get an audition. So he introduced me to Gordon Beck and Jeff Klein. And I mean, they were stars. I'd seen them at the old place. And, um, and I was terrified, but anyway, I went and we did a rehearsal and about, took about eight months to get this audition. And um, by that time, John Stevens had discovered free music. Mm. And didn't want to play time anymore, so um, so when we actually did the audition, Gordon Beck said, "Oh, um, well, don't worry." So I've got a drummer who's just come down from up north. It was Tony Oxley. So my audition trio was Gordon Beck, Tony Oxley, and Jeff Klein, and and Ronnie gave me four weeks there, which is what they used to do. It wasn't unusual because people, they had a slot, you know, a month each, and I was opposite Roland Kirk. And uh, yeah, that was, but I was still doing things, I was working at the Lilliput in Bermondsey, it was a pub in Jamaica Road, and uh, with John Taylor, who I'd met doing one of these guest spots in a place called the Albert at Chingford, and he came, he came and sat in and gave me his phone number and said, if ever you need a piano player. I mean, he'd just come from Hastings. I think he was working for the tax office at the time, Inland Revenue. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it was... And then, of course, John Stevens, having discovered free music, then started to organise get-togethers. And he asked me if I would like to go along. And I had no idea what you had to do. But I thought, well, this seems good, you know, and it, and meeting a lot of people. And Kenny Wheeler was there, yeah. said nothing, as usual. Like Kenny was very <laughs> taciturn and uh, just played and then stood there. Um, but Dave Holland used to come along. Well, Dave used to come and, and sit in with me and John at the, at the Lilliput because um, he was in a house that, where John was living. Um, and uh, they found out that one of them loved Oscar Peterson and the other one loved Ray Brown, so. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a friendship immediately. And um, yeah, but these free sessions were amazing. And um, I, I would, I, they weren't what I wanted to do in the end. You know, I, 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 I felt that it was a discovery. You know? and, it, and you had to listen to what other people were doing, but you also had to contribute something yourself, which was unusual. I mean, for singers, I suppose, we'd all been used to singing songs, um, not having to sort of make something up on the spot. Um, it was a kind of stuff, really, I probably wouldn't have wanted to listen to it, but, <laughs> but I loved doing it. Um, and it was a big movement, and John started, John Stevens started to create all kinds of things, you know, spontaneous music ensemble, mm -hmm. and I did some things with them. Um, but it, it wasn't really the direction that I absolutely wanted to go in, but like completely, because I still loved songs. And, um, and then I was meeting Kenny Wheeler, he asked me to, to, if I'd like to do a broadcast with his big band. And the first time he, he arranged a standard for me to sing. Which one? I think it was I'll Never Be The Same, I think. Um, 
And I wasn't ever the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next time he asked me to, to do a broadcast with him, he'd written me in as part of the band, which was, well, I, I don't know. I mean, luckily I could read, so I had a chance, you know. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was an incredible time. I, I, I just, you know, when, when one looks back, it, it, it was well documented at the time. A lot of, a, a lot of uh, records were released, but a lot, a lot of them uh, weren't available for many, many years. It's only really been in the last 10, 15 years that a lot of that repertoire has, has, has been to come up. In fact, you know, your, your album for Argo in 1971 uh, was, was, was uh, deleted by Decca, as you yeah. do. Uh, but then I think Dusk Fire put it out they uh, did, a few yeah. years ago, and uh, but copies <laughs> were, were, were going for ridiculous amounts of money. It, 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 it was it was a great great album. It was so important at the time. I, th I think I think that wasn't that the year you were Melody Maker's Singer of the Year. Well, that's how it happened. I I, I won the Melody Maker poll, and Decca suddenly thought, oh, who is this? <laughs> um, and, I was on some albums with Michael Garrick um, already, but... The Heart is a Lotus. Yeah, The Heart is a Lotus, but that was Argo, which was an offshoot of Decca, and they mostly did um, The Spoken Word, as, as I'm sure you <laughs> know. Um, but as I recorded for Argo, they, they said, oh, okay, well, well, we'll give you an album of your own. And I thought, right, I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to include as many of my friends as I can, and so it was, a, it was some ten piece uh, pieces and uh, some just a trio, and um, John Taylor did the arrangements, and well, as you know, all sorts of people were on it that were around at that time, and it probably wasn't what they were imagining it I, I was going to do, so it didn't really well, it wasn't out very long. I think before, but they deleted all kinds of things. And Mike Gibbs recorded an album for them too, which was deleted as well. I mean, yeah, it was. It's very sad what happened to a lot. They've got the yeah. land, lot of the land sound recordings and all those things. Uh, I remember talking to Tony Hall, who actually managed, I think he had a copy of pretty much everything really? <laughs> that was ever released by yeah. any of these independent labels. And, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was so sad that, that they all went out of circulation for so yes. long. But and that was even the, really the case with, with, with your first recording, which was the Amancio de Silva Quartet, Hondono. Yes. I mean, I, I didn't know Amancio before. Um, he asked me if I'd be on this album, and I, I went to his house and he showed me some of the music. Um, I think... I don't know how he knew about me. It could have been through Michael Garrick, possibly, um, or Ian Carr. Ian was a was a great champion um, of all kinds of people. Um, wonderful, wonderful person. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, he he had. Um, well, I think he must have recommended me. I, d I don't know, but somehow I got this call to do the yeah, album. And of course, Joe Harry was on it, who was a big star at the time. Well, he was to me, anyway. Um, oh, fantastic horn player. Fantastic yeah. player. Now, it, it's, such, it's such a great album. It, 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 uh, I played it a few days ago, and it sounds just as good now as, as when I first heard it, which it's, 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 it's a phenomenal recording. Mm, funny. I mean, I never, I never play it. <laughs> I never play those albums. But... Um, yeah, I, I mean, it seemed to, I don't know, it seemed to strike a something, with a chord with a lot of people. Um, yeah. Can, can you remember where you, where you did it? I think it was Lansdowne. Oh, wonderful. I think so. I mean, I didn't really know much. I was probably terrified most of the time. And whenever I went to do anything, it was new. Um, and that was, that was the very first time I'd been in a studio. Um, yeah, so... At that, at, that, at that point, when there was so much great uh, BBC work going on, did you, did you manage to get into any of the studio recordings for any, any projects at that time? 
Um, what do you mean the broadcasts that they yeah, do? Yeah, there were all sorts of all sorts of radio shows. Yes, well, it, all the made of ale stuff, which yeah. was beautiful. The jazz clubs. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the very first one I did was in 1967. Um, after I, I'd been at Ronnie Scott's, but I couldn't. You couldn't. It's really difficult to get a broadcast. Um, they kept saying, "Oh." You've got to submit a tape. I thought, well, I've done a month at Ronnie Scott's. I've still got to submit a tape. Anyway, eventually they did give me the broadcast. And uh, I, I mean, there's a, a story attached to that, actually, that somebody I was going out with at the time found out that Carmen McRae was in London. And she was my, well, one of my favourite singers at the time. And he rang up and he said, oh, um, my girlfriend's, loves your singing, um, she'd love to meet you. And she said, what's her name? And, and he told her, she said, yeah, well, I want to meet her, should I heard her last night on the radio. My first ever broadcast, she was in a hotel room and she was listening to the radio and they used to put you on at midnight, you know, I think it was about 20 minutes, the broadcast. And that Humphrey Littleton introducing, and it was Gordon Beck, Jeff Klein, and Ronnie Stevenson, oh, who wonderful. eventually went to Germany, I think. Um, but he, um, you know, we, we did this, this broadcast, and she happened to hear it <laughs> in a hotel room. And so I went and we did a little interview for Crescendo magazine, I think it was, mm -hmm. which was, was quite astounding really to me to be doing an interview with her but um yeah she was she was lovely actually she was very interested and um she's a fabulous singer yeah fabulous singer yeah incredible voice i, I just want to get into you know the free era and 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 how that led i don't want to use the term avant-garde because it has too many other different meanings but 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 the the whole the whole thing of making sounds and not noise, uh, the, the whole thing of, of, of wordless improvisation. Mm. I mean, how, how well, some people would call it noise. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, did that de how did that develop? And how, uh, how, how, did, how did you, did, uh, at the only point you felt that could be your calling card or that, that was something that you felt you, was unique to you? Well, I hadn't heard anybody else doing it um, except I mean, I'd heard Ella Fitzgerald scat singing, you know, without words, and I loved that. And when I heard it, and I, I copied all the solos. Well, I just played them so much that I, you know, they sunk in, and I could sing them. Um, but I didn't like the idea of singing those syllables that she sang. You know, the, the shoe and wee wop, and I, I don't know. It just I thought this is not right for for me. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't do it. And, and then I was singing songs and I, well, it was through Ian Carr again, he introduced me to Neil Ardley. He'd heard me and he said, oh, you should sing with the new jazz orchestra. So he said, I'll introduce you to Neil. So he did. And I began to sing with the new jazz orchestra and, and uh, um, Neil was arranging, you know, very much like Gil Evans, and yeah. he was transcribing some of the Gil Evans arrangements. And uh, anyway, Michael Garrick was on piano with them at that time, and he had some songs that he'd written, and he said, well, would you like, you know, have a look at these and see what you think. And he'd written words as well as music. So I looked at them and I learnt some of them. And I went to a gig that he was doing, I think probably the Phoenix, Cavendish Square, <laughs> Um, you remember that? Um, and uh, he said, would you like to sit in and sing one of the songs? So I did. And I was about to just go and sit down and he said, no, don't sit down, join in on the next piece. Well, I didn't know the next piece, but it was one of these things, it was just like a one chord thing, probably in 10-8 or something. It was all, always odd time signatures. Mm. And um, so I... I thought, well, I listened a bit, and then I, I took a solo, wordless solo, which I hadn't done before. I'd always 
to have the, the, the words of whatever I was singing, the, the, the tune I was singing, and then I would improvise a new tune, but keeping the words. And suddenly there, I, I, I improvised without words. And at the end of the evening, he said, well, you know, his front line was two saxophones and trumpet. And he said, oh, Jim Phillip was one of the saxophone players, and Art Seaman was the other one, mm -hmm. and, and it was Ian was on trumpet. And he said, would you like to join the band? Jim's leaving and you could sing the saxophone parts. And I, you know, I, I leapt at it because I realised that there was something else that I could do with the voice apart from just seeing words and seeing the melodies. Um, and so that was a great opportunity. Um, and the things followed from that, you know, as I say, Kenny asked me to... Yes. Did your broadcast and wrote me in as an instrument and yeah and but I hadn't really heard anybody sing without words apart from Ella. I also found that you see none of those syllables would fit with that kind of music that I was doing, um, so I just tried to keep it as simple as possible without much affectation, you know, without, I mean, you obviously have to sing some consonants if you're going to sing a line, um, you've got to, uh, to put some sort of, yeah, so, some consonants in, um, and, but I, I'd always tried to keep them, keep everything to a minimum, so it's mostly b, b, and d's. I mean, it, it really is using the voice as an instrument, I'm not mm. saying with singing words and singing tunes and using voice as an instrument as well, but it's almost going to a, its purest sense. Uh, mm. If it's something that feels, as it still feels, listening back, very refreshing, very, very, very open. And, and when, when you actually listen to it in, in uh, context with instruments, it, the, 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 the skill, your skill of working in with other instruments and, and actually giving it its own identity uh, was, 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 was yeah. I'm not saying this very well, but no, it, I, it, 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 it was, it really was sure. something that synthesizers and other things that came later tried to emulate. You were kind of doing a natural thing that, well, that, that uh, yeah, I, it, I mean, I always felt that the voice is another sound. I mean, it has the added uh, um, thing of uh, being able to sing words, but it is a sound. And as a sound, I don't see why it couldn't be used with other sounds. Absolutely. And yeah, it does give, I mean, people say like with Kenny Wheeler's music, sometimes you, you feel that the voice is there, you don't hear it. I know, and that's another thing, I never wanted, I never imagined the voice being out front. To me, it was always something where I wanted to blend with the sounds I was hearing um, to make an overall sound, not like, say, I don't know, Ray Conniff singers or something like that. You know, where you, where Absolutely. Out front. It, it, for me, it always felt it had to be part of a sound. And I was really happy doing that. I, mean, I still like singing words, but the, the, you know, just to be able to be part of the sound, I realised was what I wanted to do when I first heard Miles Davis. And kind of blue. <laughs> kind of blue. It's the most wonderful record. Where, where did you first hear it? Where? Did Probably. you hear it on the radio? Or no, or did... no. I I I joined this <laughs> this kind of a club where you somebody told you about the new albums that were coming out. Um, I guess I don't, I don't know where you would have heard it on the radio anyway. I mean, the only place is Radio Luxembourg. You might, I did hear some things like I heard Ella and Louie, that album, they played the track every night. And I, I bought that because I'd, I'd heard it on the radio. But um, a friend of mine said, oh, there's this guy, he gets all these albums, um, the latest things, you know, from uh, the States. and he came out and he said, oh, there's this Miles Davis album. Um, that was another thing that I, I bought. You know, I used to pay so much a week, and then when you've got so much money, 
he'd say, oh, well, there's this, you could have this, and he'd say, what's coming out, you know? And I, I bought um, Porgy and Bess, which I was absolutely knocked out with, because, of course, I knew a lot of the, lot of the, the pieces of because of the opera. Um, but he came up with this, uh, oh, this is my latest Miles Davis one, Kind of Blue. I said, oh, okay, I'll buy that one. Well, it was just such a, I don't know what it was, it was some kind of revelation. It just, I couldn't, I couldn't stop playing it. And I played it over and over. It was not like anything that I'd heard before. And it, it made me feel that I'd love to be in some kind of music like that. You know, some kind of group where they play that kind of music. But I didn't know quite what it was that I liked about it. But of course, later I realised it was, there's a lot of modal stuff on it. And that appealed to me because, well, I always liked to, you know, Debussy and Ravel and all that, that <laughs> French school. And um, this somehow reminded me of that. And um, so I, and I just thought, well, it would be wonderful if ever the voice could be involved in music like this. But I didn't know how. You know, I thought, well, maybe, I suppose if you wrote words to those tunes, maybe that would be a way in. But I didn't. And I just carried on just singing the standards that I was singing. But I think in the end, I came to, I realised when I was doing the, the, the wordless music, you know, improvising, and being part of like Michael's band and then, you know, Michael and then Kenny's big band, I was actually doing this thing that I hadn't really, I hadn't known what it was when I heard Kind of Blue. But it was a terrifically influential record. I mean, so many people choose it. And if you ask for one um, influential record that they've heard in jazz, it's that. And the amazing thing is the musicians hadn't written, there, there was no rehearsal. No. There, 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 was, there was just an idea of a top line. Mm. And that was it. A couple of sessions, it was done. Yeah. Well, you know, I didn't know any of that hearing it, but it just struck me as I, I well, it's pivotal, wasn't it? Really, it's it's still the album yeah. by which all other jazz yeah, albums are judged. So. Yeah, it's 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 it's, it's great that I, I I've spoken to a lot of people who all said how important it was to them mm. in, in many many different ways. Uh, in connecting to the blues, in connecting, yeah. and people who weren't interested in jazz, uh, you play them. Kind of blue, and they go, but that's not jazz. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> it, it 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 it's it has it has a yeah. remarkable place in. in and you music still hear it. You still hear excerpts of it used in the background of plays and things on the radio. You know, but it, it, it's it's a sound. It's part of the culture. Yeah. It's, it's part of the fabric. Mm. You, your your recording career uh, and 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 everything. It, it's tied up with one of the most. Interesting uh, producers, the, the founder producer of ECM, Manfred Eicher. Mm. I mean, you're, 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 obviously your your uh, somewhere called Home album, but all the wonderful things you did with Asif, which was your group with John and Kenny, which was really a, a, a remarkable band. It was, but you know, strange thing is, <laughs> it didn't, it wasn't generally thought to be. It, it wasn't accepted, I don't think, by the press at the time, because I've recently been going through, you know, John, John Taylor died in, in 2015, and I've finished up with a lot of his music and, and his stuff, and I've been going through it. And today, I found some reviews of Azimuth. Very funny. I mean, I, I remembered that it wasn't that accepted by the critics at the time. I think now it would be a completely different story, but 1979, it was, people didn't know what to make of it because it wasn't something that, well, it was not jazz, is it really? Because it hasn't got any bass and drums, just keyboards and then, well, piano on the first one. And then, then John got a synthesizer and, and 
and be able, and came up with pieces using you know synth and voice and trumpet. To me, those records weren't so much jazz, more improvised chamber music, mm. and uh, I, I, I think that they were difficult at the time. I can, under, I, I can understand an audience, especially who'd been listening to fusion or been listening to yes. the, begin, the beginnings of smooth jazz and things which were sort of happening. It, 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 it was a very difficult ask. And, uh, yeah, I suppose it was. <laughs> but you, you were saying that the, uh, uh, a lot of the compositions changed uh, in the studio. Do you think that was to do with the production, Manfred Eichler's influence? Um, but sometimes it was, yeah. Sometimes he would suggest things. Um, or you'd feel he wasn't particularly happy about something and you think, well, how do we get around this? Because <laughs> you want the producer to be happy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, he, we'd have a piece and, and then we'd, like for instance, there's about a piece called Adios Ioni. And I think he didn't seem that he was that keen on, John played a bit of rhythmic stuff. And I don't know whose idea it was, but we said, oh, well, what we'll do, we'll have the trumpet and voice, just take three notes and we will improvise with the three notes. Just a different, and, and he built up, he overdubbed <laughs> that. And then John went into the studio and played this and he just brought in this rhythm underneath this. And of course, Manfred immediately heard something that, that really he felt was inspiring. And sort of Boris said, jumped up, yes, like now we have something. But I mean, we'd always had that. We always had that, there was a written part. But the fact that we improvised these sort of long notes and the tune came in underneath it, and he was right because it's, it's, in, impressive and, and it's something, you know, rather than just starting the tune with, the, with this rhythm. That coming in under this sort of sound of overdubbed voice and, and trumpet. That's really amazing. It, 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 a definition of jazz, which Gary Crosby uh, mentioned when, when, when he won the Queen's Medal for Music, mm. uh, the, the Queen said to him, uh, Mr. Crosby, uh, I understand jazz is where you take a small idea and by expansion turn it into a larger one, <laughs> which I think is a fantastic, a fantastic definition. Who told her that? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but it's uh, wonderful. Gary was Gary was yes. so so fun. Yes, I mean... that. And, and 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 again, that, that's 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 a perfect it's a perfect example of a producer getting involved in the process. But that's. And, yeah, uh, well, he did, he did, uh, I mean, he was always there, he always knew he was listening and, and if he didn't particularly like something, he would know because he, he wouldn't really react very enthusiastically and it would make you think again, he didn't <laughs> say, oh, I don't want that, but you would immediately think, hmm, he's not reactive, maybe we'd take another look at this piece. Let, let's move into something which, which is particularly uh, important to me. Uh, your, your lyric, A Timeless Place for Jimmy Rolls, The Peacocks, oh, yes. which is one of the most, A, it's one of the most beautiful pieces of music. Mm -hmm. And it's a fantastic example of combining with something that's already there, collaborating with something that's already there to take it somewhere further. Uh, I, I think it's 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 sensational, and, and the performance of it is wonderful, and other people's performances of it are wonderful. It, it's become a it's become a classic in itself. From when I first heard it, I think it was I think I, I remember Bill Evans and Stan Getz playing, yes. and and uh, what was your inspiration? Well, it was the Bill Evans version, not not with Stan Getz. He did, he had a trio version. Yeah. Um, I've forgotten the name of the album now, but. I heard this, and of course the bridge section is oh, suddenly so it's like Lulu. <laughs> it's so, so strange intervals. 
But I was drawn to it and I thought, I have to sing this. Um, but it's the kind of thing, I, it just, I thought it, it's got to have words. And um, so I started and I didn't get very far and left it. And then I had an opportunity to, uh, to do a, a, a recording for radio, the Nord Norddeutsche Rundfunk, mm -hmm. um, with, the, with an orchestra there. And they said, well, you can have 10 arrangements. And those were the days. Um, <laughs> and 10 <laughs> arrangements. Um, and I asked Steve Gray, who was a wonderful, wonderful arranger. And I started thinking, well, which tune shall I do? And I thought, that tune, that Peacock's tune, is definitely one that would be lovely with an orchestra. So I had mentioned it to Steve and he said, yeah, he said, but um, you tell, you've got to send me the words before I do the arrangement. He was like that. He always wanted words. He, he always knew what the words were, you know. And so he said, you have to send me the words before I do the arrangement. So I thought, all right, I'd better get my finger out. I'd better get this done. And so, I. but the other thing is, I, I, I didn't, no, I thought, well, the peacocks, it's called the peacocks. Well, and, I, and I thought, well, it's a difficult word to incorporate, really. Um, but I thought, well, where would you get peacocks? And I thought, well, stately homes here, you know, in England, you have them in stately homes often. Um, and I had done a gig with Michael Garrick at Belton House in um, Lincolnshire. Grantham, near Grantham. And I think it was Alan Jackson was on drums and and his car, and we were traveling with him, or I was, and his car broke down. So they, they said, oh, well, you have to leave it here overnight and get the AA in the morning. So we, we all went back to <laughs> wait for the AA to come and fix this car. And uh, while we were there, they the, the people that, were running the house, said, oh, you, you know, just you can wander around as you like. So we did, and, you know, there were, there's usually this, you know, these cords there to stop you <laughs> going into rooms, but they'd all gone. And there was the room where Prince Charles had slept when he was doing his pilot training nearby. Um, and it had its own chapel. And I don't know, I just loved it. And, and, I remembered the atmosphere of this house and I thought I started to think about that you know I thought, oh, but they didn't have any peacocks there but it's the kind of place they might have had and, um, and I just came up with the first line you know the, the windows looked out onto a pattern never-ending of flowers and into little pathways for descending to the gardens far below us. I mean, there weren't any pathways descending, but it was all started from the atmosphere of this house. And I just built up a little story around that. Generally, do you find lyric writing hard work? Y yes. Um, yes, it is. It, yeah. Except there, there are some lyrics that come very quickly, like the, uh, Fred Hirsch, I did an album with Fred Hirsch, an American pianist, and he sent me a, a tune which he called Valentine, and I wrote the words in about 10 minutes, and he said he'd written the tune in about 10 minutes, and I don't know, they, they're very, they seem to be very successful, he, you know, he said he can't hear that tune now without the words, they're, they're part of it. You wrote a wonderful song with... If I'm Liz, so, uh... Oh, what, Vieste? Yes. Oh, yeah, he recorded, he recorded it in my English words, didn't he? But, um, you came, yeah. Oh, oh he's wonderful. I'd like moments. to talk a bit about education and the importance of, the, 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 the importance of jazz music education for young people and performance opportunities for young mm. musicians. Uh, especially in places where there aren't music colleges nearby or set up like Tomorrow's Warriors or Jazz Refreshed or you know, the local, the, when, when you're outside the M25, things can get a lot more complicated. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's such a problem, although with online technology and, and the, especially where mm. we're sitting out at the moment in, in the middle of a pandemic, 
you know, there, there, there are opportunities out there to do things, but it's, it's so restricted. Yes. How do you, how, do you have, I, I know jazz education is terribly important to you, and you have a relationship with the guild will go mm. back. And, well, how, 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 do you have any thoughts or feelings about how things could be improved? Or, or well, of course, uh, there is a, like, the National Youth Jazz Collective. I mean, they go around, at, um, the Izzy Barrett runs, and um, of course. they go, you know, they find very young musicians, um, I think you've got to be under 18. I was thinking um, before the Maijo stage, it's for young yes. young people to actually find the find the teacher, find learn an instrument. The um, thing the thing is, I mean, that jazz is, is changing all the time, you know, and, and uh, there are other influences coming in, like world music. There's you know, you, you see jazz festivals, and you think, well, most of that's not really what I would have thought of as jazz. It's world music and it's other stuff, mm -hmm. you know, but. It's, it's, it's got to change, I guess. Um, but at least if, pe if young people have the opportunity to hear some of the, the history of, of perhaps the, you know, what went before what, they, what they've heard and liked now, it, I think it's necessary. But it's so important you, if you're learning any kind of instrument or you're interested in music, to listen to the people that you like, listen to what they were listening to, mm. and to keep taking it back yeah. to the source. Yes, it, it is. But um, and I guess if they manage to get into a well, by the time they get into a, a music college, they have probably well, obviously heard and learnt a lot, and they would sort of delve into the history, I suppose, in their education. Well, I wish but, there were more. <laughs> well, it, again, times are very tough now. Uh, we've had so many local festivals and local things, but you know, with what Dee were trying to do with education, it's, it's wonderful. Mm. And I uh, hope that we're going to find more people around the country who are going to get involved in that. Because yes. you know, without young musicians coming through, uh, you know, mm. the future of the music is, it will change, and it should change, and that's a good thing. But it needs the fresh blood all the time. Yeah. Talking of fresh blood, you're an artist who, over you know, a period of many years, you've reinvented yourself, or always changed. Not changed your concept, but been able to work with different people and do different things. Uh, thinking, you know, the work with the printmakers, Nikki's yes. thing, which is a, a wonderful project. You, you, you seem to have an idea for something, then want to. Just get, you can you can sort of jump in and do it. I mean, I mean yeah. the, the Steve Swallow uh, project. I know you've written words for his music before, but mm. I know that's something you're doing at the moment. How did that come about? What the, the current yeah. thing? Well, it was gosh, I don't know when it was. Many years ago, we did a concert of um, that that John Cumming actually um, organised me to do something with Steve and uh, so I, I just I wrote a lot of words to his music and um, we did a concert in London and then like nothing happened I did another concert of some of that music not with him mm -hmm. but in Italy with uh, Gwilym Simcock was on piano on that one I think and Tim Garland oh. um, and uh, yeah it, it was that was lovely um, but nothing ever happened and I think I, I thought well if Steve really wants to do it I'm sure he'll he'll suggest it and he never did um, and then I said I was I suppose it was um, bef before this current lockdown I just wrote to him and said oh there's a piece of yours that I'd I've, I, I wrote words to it but I haven't really got the lead sheet um, I think we'd done it and John just, John Taylor just transcribed it and played it. But I never actually had the music. And he wrote back and he said, he's very funny actually, Steve. He said, you've prodded a sleeping dog. <laughs> and he said, it's reminded me, I really want to record those things that you wrote words for. I've just never done anything about it. And I thought, well, I thought he didn't, 
He said, I didn't know whether you wanted to do it. <laughs> so he thought I didn't want to do it, and he, I thought he didn't want to, and so the years went by and nothing happened. So I, I immediately said, well, okay, right, we'll, we'll sort of, I'll, I'll listen to more of your stuff and, and you know, change the concept a bit because the previous thing was called the ladies' suite, and each piece was um, inspired by... A woman, a poet, or an author, an authoress, or you know, um, all different people, um, and so they all had a link to a woman, and it was a kind of a story, really, about a man who's thinking of all his dreaming of his previous lovers, and there were all these different women, you see, and, uh, and anyway, so I wrote all these words and. I say nothing ever happened. So they're all there, but of course I don't want to do exactly the same thing, so I've got to alter some of them and rewrite them mm. and bring in other pieces. But of course I thought, well, I don't know whether we're going to be able to record it, but I just wrote to Manfred Eicher, who had been ill, and uh, was a, we did a, a festival, an ECM festival at Royal Academy of Music in January. Mm -hmm. And Manfred should have been there, but he couldn't make it because he was ill. So I thought, I'm going to write to him, see how he is, and just drop in this little thing about, I've been speaking to Steve Swallow, um, about recording some of his songs that I've written words for. And the next day I had a reply saying, oh, I'm interested in this, I'd like to hear this. And which is, I mean, to get a reply the next day is, is quite something. Um, so we sorted, of course, we're in lockdown by this time. Um, and they've got a backlog of things that, that they were going to record and hadn't recorded. So they said, well, it'll have to be next April. So whether it will be next April, who knows, but usually... Would you have everything written by then? Oh, yeah. All oh, right. Well, <laughs> you know, it's nothing like a deadline. Absolutely. <laughs> once, once we have a date, a real date, you know, then things will get finished. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Norma. That was really great. Oh, I really enjoyed it so a, much. It's a real great pleasure. pleasure. Really. Thanks, Adam.